Welcome back. So we've been talking about sparsity and compressed sensing and how you can reconstruct uh, high dimensional signals from relatively few measurements, which is a really interesting and powerful field of applied mathematics and statistics uh, that's coming out just recently in the last few decades because of sparsity and sparse optimization. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is kind of turning this paradigm a little bit upside down. Uh, instead of the compressed sensing idea where you take random measurements, we're gonna ask the question, can you do better if you get to plan where you put your measurements? if you know something about your system. So this is very much an engineering kind of oriented idea of, you know, let's say I'm not just measuring a system at random, but I know that I'm measuring the Gulf of Mexico, or I know that I'm measuring a person's face. Can I use that prior information to do a better job and to tailor where I put those sensors to get the most information possible, okay? So just a quick recap uh, of kind of the compressed sensing problem, and I'll point out that this idea of targeted or tailored sparse sensing uh, is work done with uh, Krithika Manahar, Bing Brunton, Nathan Cooks, and myself, and you can read about this in uh, our article in the IEEE Control Systems magazine from 2018. Okay, so just to recap kind of the compressed sensing picture, you have some high dimensional signal X. This might be uh, a high resolution image reshaped as a very, very tall skinny vector. And we believe that we have evidence that most of these signals, most of these images are sparse in some transform basis, some generic basis, like a Fourier transform or a wavelet transform basis. And so in that basis, we have an S vector, which is very sparse, and that's the basis of, of all of it image compression, and also the idea of compressed sensing is that when you have a signal that's sparse in some universal basis, you can get away with measuring not the full megapixel image X, but a massively downsampled image Y, as long as those measurements, uh, those, those fewer measurements were taken in a somehow random way. Okay, so if this C matrix is kind of randomly pulling pixels from our high resolution image, then compressed sensing says that you can reconstruct uh, this unknown signal S, the sparse vector, by running this, uh, this optimization problem that's penalizing the one norm of S. So the one norm of S, when you penalize it, promotes sparsity. And essentially we find the sparsest S that is consistent with these measurements in Y by running this optimization. So that's standard compressed sensing. Uh, and this is really good for, for lots of problems, for um, for problems where uh, I have you know, some random measurements of my system and it might be a coffee cup or it might be a picture of a mountain or a human face or a fluid flow field or whatever, this basis psi is rich enough to describe basically anything you'll see and your, your image will be sparse in that basis. So this is what we think of as a universal uh, encoding basis, psi, and this compressed sensing problem is good when you have measurements but you don't know kind of what system your measurements came from. It could be a coffee cup, it could be a picture of a dog, it could be a picture of a mountain. Uh, this is gonna work for reconstructing that image, okay? But what if we know exactly what type of system we're measuring. I'm not measuring anything at all in this universal transform basis, but instead I'm measuring something very specific. Like I know I'm measuring pixels from an image of a person's face, or I know that I'm measuring you know, individual locations in a fluid flow field. So I don't need this full n by n square matrix of all you know, uh, Fourier coefficients or, or, or wavelet. I don't need the full wavelet basis or the full Fourier basis uh, if I'm only encoding human faces or, or flow fields, okay? And so this is the idea of tailored sensing that we explore in this paper, is if you know what category of system you're sensing, you know that you're sensing a particular flow field or you're trying to measure the Gulf of Mexico, you can take data from that system and you can build a much, much smaller library that describes that data. So this, for example, could be done using the singular value decomposition, which we talked about in chapter one of our book, Data-Driven Science and Engineering, uh, and there's links to the, uh, the YouTube video uh, on the SVD. So this could be a basis that is very tailored to your specific problem, so eigenfaces or eigenflow fields. And notice that it's much smaller than your Fourier and wavelet basis because it doesn't need to describe anything you could possibly see, 
all right? And in this tailored basis, uh, psi r, this reduced basis, now we get to ask the question, first of all, how do random sensors work? If I just randomly pick sensors the, to measure in this, could I estimate what those coefficients are, uh, these a coefficients? Now, now notice that this a vector is no longer sparse. This a vector basically tells you what linear combination of these three columns do I need to reconstruct my face or my flow field. Uh, and the second question is, can I optimize the sensor placement in this C matrix to be perfectly matched, to be uh, in some sense tailored to this particular basis that my data is, uh, is easily represented in. And so that's the question uh, we're asking. And it turns out that this is very, very much related to minimizing the condition number of that little three by three theta matrix of C times psi. Okay, so uh, up here we have a big n by n psi matrix, our universal wavelet or Fourier basis. Down here we have a tailored basis for our particular uh, system. And now we're going to be able to not just pick random sensors, you needed random sensors up here. Down here we're gonna be able to tailor particularly good sensor locations for this basis based on uh, minimizing the condition number of theta. Now there's a lot of kind of math of why that's what you want to do for good signal reconstruction, and I'll, I'll probably talk about that, that later, but for now I'm just going to let you kind of read more about it if you're interested. Okay, and so this is kind of a good example of two tailored bases, right? So if I only was looking at flow fields or I was only looking at human faces, I wouldn't need that big wavelet or Fourier basis. I know that I can represent human faces very efficiently using the singular value decomposition in terms of a few eigenfaces. Now here I've only expanded up to three. In reality you might need you know, 50 or 100 or 200, but it's still much, much smaller, many, many fewer eigenfaces than pixels in this image. Same thing with flow fields. If I have something like fluid flow past a cylinder, I know that I can get a very faithful representation of this with maybe three or four or five uh, eigenflow fields from the singular value decomposition. And each of these columns, kind of this uh, A1, A2, and A3, those flow fields, if I reshaped them, those would be my columns uh, phi1, phi2, phi3. Same thing with these eigenfaces. So those form the columns of this, sorry, of this psi matrix. And now what we're gonna try to do, now that we know that we're only in this library or this library, we don't need to do random sensors anymore. We're gonna tailor our sensors to do a particular good job, a particularly good job at uh, reconstructing these images. Okay, uh, and so this is the idea, this is uh, one of Krithika's slides that, that she made for this flow field example. So let's say that this um, is our basis psi, our tailored basis for, for this particular flow field. So here she's keeping the first five principal components or five singular vectors from the singular value decomposition. And what we're gonna try to do is find the particularly good rows uh, to sample, which correspond to these entries in C. These are basically sampling rows of psi. And of course, those also correspond to physical sampling locations in the actual flow field. Every row uh, of this data is a particular entry in this flow field. And so this is a really cool observation um, that was made by Krithika and also by uh, Dermach and Guyerkin uh, in the context of reduced order modeling and empirical interpolation is that if you take the QR factorization of your psi matrix, there are, so the QR factorization, you're trying to break up your, your matrix uh, into this Q times R, where Q and R have nice properties of like upper triangular and, and orthogonal and things like that. It turns out that you have these pivot locations. So the pivoted QR will essentially pivot your data to have a better condition QR factorization. And it turns out that the pivot locations in this C transpose matrix are exactly the best locations to uh, sample your system at. So these are nearly optimal sensor locations for this library. You can obtain those by looking at the pivots from the pivoted QR factorization. Now that's awesome because QR factorization is super simple uh, to code up and it already exists in almost every software package you would ever want to program in. So in MATLAB here, it's essentially a one-liner to run the pivoted QR 
and then you just pull out those pivot locations, and those are your sensors. I mean, this isn't pseudocode, this is actual MATLAB code. Uh, and it's also similarly very easy in Python and other languages, because the QR factorization is ubiquitous. In fact, the QR factorization is how we numerically compute the singular value decomposition. So you're already computing this all the time, even if you didn't know it. Okay, and there's this cool illustration that Krithika made to illustrate this idea that when you, uh, essentially what you're trying to do in this pivoted QR is you're trying to uh, essentially go through all of the columns uh, of this psi transpose matrix, or all of the rows of psi, if you like, and you're looking for, uh, for the column that has the largest two norm, and then you take that column and you Gram Schmidt out all of the other columns with respect to that direction. So you pick the first, the column with the largest, uh, the largest magnitude, and then you kind of orthogonalize every other column with respect to it. Then you look for the next column that has the largest magnitude, and you bring it over, and you orthogonalize all of the other columns with respect to it, and you do this repeatedly over and over and over again. This is basically what you're doing in the QR factorization, is you're just identifying you know, individual uh, either rows or columns that have the largest norm. You're kind of factoring those out by Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, and then you're finding the next one, and the next one, and the next one in a greedy optimization. And all of those locations, uh, those pivot locations where you found the largest, uh, the largest row, those are your sensor locations that are most well suited for this particular basis. And that kind of makes sense actually, because essentially what you're doing is you're finding sensors that have the largest two norm across all of the all of the the kind of uh, modes in this library. So those are are sensors that give you a lot of information about what different columns of psi are doing. And then the next sensor and the next sensor and the next sensor are giving you kind of uh, in order uh, less and less information about the variance in, in these columns of psi. So it kind of makes sense. I'd like you to think about this a little bit more and kind of convince yourself that this greedy uh, QR pivoting algorithm does in fact give you the kind of uh, a nearly optimal amount of information about what's happening in this basis. Okay, and you can do this for uh, for your eigenfaces example. So this is kind of um, the original image with all of these red dots on it, where the optimal sensor locations were identified. I think in this case we had to use maybe fifty or a hundred uh, eigenfaces, and so we're using fifty or a hundred points uh, that are optimized for this basis. And the QR reconstruction, it doesn't look perfect, but it's, it's definitely much closer to this original image than if you had dropped the same amount of points randomly uh, and tried to, to invert uh, to solve for an image. So the QR-based sensors give you a much, much better signal reconstruction, even measuring only a very few pixels compared to, uh, to, to random sensing. So this is really neat, um, and I want to just point out, I guess I'll go back for a moment uh, here, once you have these measurements y, let's say, so, we, so what we've done, the kind of steps in the operation are you collect a big library of training data of flow fields or of human faces. And that allows you to build this tailored library psi r. So that's step one. You collect a bunch of data and you build psi r. Then you run the pivoted QR on this matrix, and that tells you the locations that you should be using for your measurement matrix for C. It tells you where to sense to measure your system uh, in space is given by C. So that's step two. Then you measure your system with those sparse sensors. That gives you this little vector Y. And then the last step, that was step three, so then the last step is once you have Y, I know C and I know Psi, so I know theta. Now I just invert theta to solve for A. And if I have this little A vector, I can multiply it by my library and I can reconstruct the full high dimensional image. Okay, so that's what we've been doing here um, is essentially we, we use our sparse sensors in red here. We estimate what that A coefficient was, kind of the mixture of my 100 eigenfaces that are consistent with these 100 measurements, and then I add up those eigenfaces in that mixture, and this is the reconstruction. And this is better than if you had done random sensors, okay?
so there's also this really cool connection to polynomial interpolation uh, that Krithika found. So essentially, if you take um, data from some from some function, these uh, yellow points are non-evenly spaced. These are the nearly optimal interpolant points using QR factorization. It turns out these are related to uh, optimal interpolation points called Fakete points. And if you used equally spaced points, if you kind of uh, did not do this, this uh, better QR uh, placement of your sensors, but instead you placed them uniformly, you would get this ringing kind of Gibbs phenomenon that we've talked about before. So really, uh, there's a nice connection to classical interpolation theory um, that I find really interesting. Okay, so uh, there's also, you know, you can apply this in lots and lots and lots of different fields. Uh, we've used this to understand insect flight. So insects have strain sensitive neurons on their wings, and we don't think that those are placed randomly. We think that those are, are targeted to estimate certain uh, environmental signals of interest. We've used this for uh, manufacturing with Boeing to, to streamline their sensing for manufacturing. Uh, we've used it for control, and you can also use it to figure out where to drop point sensors in a system like the ocean uh, if you wanted to predict its dynamics. Okay, so just to summarize kind of what's the big idea, um, if you don't know anything about what you're measuring, you need to use a universal basis like uh, Fourier or wavelets. That's the compressed sensing paradigm. And you need quite a few more measurements if you're doing compressed sensing because, there's, because you just have less statistical information as a prior. If I don't know if I'm looking at a picture of a dog or a cat or a mountain or a cup of coffee, you're gonna live up here and you're gonna pay for that by having to take a lot more measurements of your system and have to work in a much larger basis, okay? But if you do know what type of sister system uh, you're measuring, so for example, you know that you're only measuring flow fields or faces, you can get away with a much, much smaller, more targeted library, uh, for example, from the SVD, the singular value decomposition. And now in this targeted library, you can design optimal sensors to give you the most information in that library. Okay, so I think this is an extremely powerful idea. It took us a long time to kind of make this uh, conceptual leap from here to here. So we, we you know, didn't realize for a while that this is what we actually really wanna be doing in a lot of physical systems is targeted sensing. But again, it uses a lot of the same ideas of high dimensional uh, geometry, patterns existing in your data, uh, and ideas of sparsity and optimization. Okay, so I hope this uh, has been interesting and I hope you try this out uh, in your research. You can download all of the code for this uh, at databookuw.com. This follows chapter three uh, of our new book on data-driven science and engineering. Uh, stay tuned, there will be more on kind of sensing and sparsity and, and all kinds of interesting data-driven techniques. Thank you.